Welcome to the Pianist TV channel. In this following masterclass, Graham Fitch discusses the importance of practicing separately, not just hands separately, but strands separately too. The filming takes place at Steinway Hall, right in the heart of London. Before Graham begins his lesson, here's a glance around Steinway's impressive showroom and Hall of Fame, as well as the all-important workshop. On this introduction, Graham plays the minuet from Ravel's Sonatine, performed on a Model D Concert Grand, the same instrument on which he gives his lesson. Welcome back to part two now of my video demonstration on separate practice. And I'm going to carry on with an idea that I left you with in part one, which was the, the idea of practicing strands separately rather than purely hands separately. Now, a fugue is a very good example of a composition that's conceived in multi-voices. And I'm going to use a demonstration here from Bach's C minor fugue from book one, which I'm sure a lot of you will have played or maybe even studying now and finding a little bit tricky to unravel all the lines, the lines of counterpoint. Now Bach wrote this piece in three voices, so let's call the top voice soprano, the alto voice, the middle voice alto, and the bottom voice bass. I'm using in this copy here, this is an open score edition of the fugue in which the lines are separated out onto three staves, which makes it very easy to see. And I do recommend this as a supplement to a conventional two-stave piano version or keyboard version of this piece. I'm going to take the tiniest little snippet here, just the, the last entry from the exposition where the bass comes in with its subject, just to show you what we need to do. Now, I've put in fingering for almost every single note because I'm going to start off by playing this in its lines, in its strands, separate strands using the fingering that I will eventually use when I put all three together. Can't overemphasize the importance of that. Let me start off by playing you the soprano line by itself. I'm going to do it slightly under tempo just so you can hear and see it a little clearer. That's the soprano line. Now let me take the alto line which starts off with a left hand note. The rest of it happens to be in the right hand, although very often in fugues you'll discover that the middle voice or middle voices are shared out between both hands, which makes it even more important to know um, by itself. Now, of course, if I were playing that line by itself, I wouldn't be using all those thumbs. But because I need the top of my hand for the soprano voice, I need to use slightly awkward fingering for that. Finally, the bass voice, which is the subject. And into the next uh, first episode. Now begins the, the fun part, which is where I combine the voices in combinations of two. So I'm now going to be showing you the soprano voice, together with the alto voice, again slightly under tempo. Now let me play the soprano together with the bass voice, so I'm going to be omitting the middle voice. remaining combination, which is the bass together with the middle voice. Now, when I put that together with all three voices, I'm going to go to, I'm going to start to use an exceptionally slow tempo, starting with this kind of tempo. And 
so on and so forth. I won't show you the whole thing. And I'll be getting to slow practice in my next demonstration, so we don't need to go into that too much here. Let me now show you the final part of this process, which I think makes a huge difference in the end to your ability to control the levels of sound. Now I'd like you to imagine three volume buttons, one for the soprano, one for the alto, and one for the bass. You've got your soprano button up full volume, and the other two are set to low. And this is how it's going to sound. turn that one down and turn my alto button up. And then I would do the same for my bass voice. recommend practicing fugues in very small sections like this. Perhaps not one bar like I did there, but I would do maybe a small enough section that you can hold that all in your short-term memory as you practice. And if you go through that step ladder approach with a fugue, one voice in turn, combinations of two, and then voicing one voice uh, stronger than the others, you'll find that an incredibly powerful way of learning a fugue really securely. If you are planning to play it from memory, and of course we all know that contrapuntal music is challenging to play from memory, I would suggest that you do all of these stages from memory if you possibly can. You'll get the best result that way. Now, let me move on to the last example I'd like to show you with uh, the idea of strands. And I'm going to move to Chopin's Etude Opus 10 number 2, the A minor Etude. Let me show you the, just the beginning of that. Um, everything together. And so on. Now this is known to be, I think generally accepted to be, one of the most virtuosic studies because I'd have to be able to do that now for two or three pages. And that's what makes Chopin etudes particularly challenging. The difficulty itself and then having to sustain that for uh, a good few minutes. Now, if we look at how that's built up, it's rather similar in structure to what we've been looking at previously. Perhaps not as clear as the fugue, but we've got an upper line. Which I need to be able to play completely by itself with no reference to what's going on underneath whatsoever. So I don't sit there and just play my top and kind of feel the underneath. I take my hand and divide it into two and I'm using the upper part of my hand independently. Now I'm keeping the underneath part very loose, very, I, I, I hesitate to use the word relaxed, but the underneath part of my hand, particularly the thumb, very loose. And I think you can hear there that I'm again giving that shape, I'm listening to the sound that I'm making. That's one strand, and that would be the most important strand to focus on in the practice, the technical practice, to be able to do that under the tempo, over the tempo, completely by itself. Now, if I take the underneath part of the right hand, I've got those notes, which I also need to know by themselves. I can then add wasn't 100% accurate, but I think you get the idea there. What I'm aiming to do is to play just my lower parts. That was a little better. <laughs> and so on. Now, coming back to the technical work that we might need to do for that study, we can play the right hand in a couple of different ways. Just before I end, I'm going to show those of you who may be working on this study who might want a couple of tips. Uh, what I'd suggest you can do to really speed up the learning. I'm now going to add my underneath right hand uh, thumb and second finger, but I'm going to immediately close my hand up. This movement, rather than keeping my hand outwards, 
If I keep my hand open, it's going to produce tension, which is going to cripple me within a line or two, let alone the three pages that I need to be able to manage. And I'd like to show you one other tip as well, which is to stop on the second note of the group, just to check that the hand is closed. See what I'm doing there? Bringing my hand together, which will give you uh, a condition of looseness to uh, enable you to play the, the study freely. And I, I can't say it's going to be easy. This study isn't easy, but it'll give you the best uh, foundation to play from. That's the end of my demonstration on separately. In my next uh, demonstration, I'm going to be talking about slow practice. So please do join me again for that.